I think the effects of traumatic experiences and toxic stress are one of the best documented, yes, most undervalued, unappreciated drivers of poor health outcomes, of health disparities in distressed communities, of overspending in health care, and of human suffering. Powerful statement. There is an undeniable link between our emotions, our unhealthy behaviors, and our poor health. And there's our cupcake. There's also a start, well, let me just back up one minute if I may. The, there was a study not too long ago, maybe I think the press release was about two weeks ago, out of the University of Chicago. And it was a study looking at a meta-analysis of 156 other studies across the country, all looking at early risk factors for early death. I'm sure it won't surprise you that obesity came out to be one of the strongest risk factors for early death. What caught my attention in the press release was the fact that loneliness and social isolation had the same risk factor for early death as obesity. Doctors and other health care providers are trained to talk to us about our symptoms. They're even trained to talk to us about our death. They are rarely trained to talk to us about our lives. There's also a stark science behind this. Some of you may be familiar with the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. Studied some 17,000 people, it was done almost 20 years ago now, uh, in Southern California, commercially insured, which is, is important in the context of the social determinants. And it started, interestingly, as a study to, to I really understand the reasons for the growing obesity in that population and why it seems so intractable, which I think is important. What they found was extraordinarily high correlations between adverse childhood experiences and chronic health problems later in life. And the more of those adverse childhood events you had, the stronger the likelihood that you'd have chronic health problems as an adult. And these adverse childhood events are anything from uh, being a child of uh, a divorcing family, to exposure to parental substance abuse, to neglect, to obviously things that are much more extreme like uh, physical and sexual violence. So how does this translate? Oops. How, how, what's the connection between these? And, and interestingly, uh, for many years I worked in the, in the children's uh, arena, and much of the efforts uh, around the ACEs study all were focused on the prevention of those adverse things. And uh, much uh, of the, many of the programs that have evolved have to, in that arena, all very important work. Little has been done on the other end of that. And here is what I think the translational reality is. You have a, and I don't mean to trivialize it, a bad event. It causes you emotional distress. None of us like emotional <laughs> distress. It's, that's why they call it distress. We want to do something about that. And in our example here, we have our cupcakes. And in fact, there's a wealth of literature that says eating sweets and carbohydrates, in fact, make us feel better in the short run, right? If that emotional distress persists, so do the cupcakes. It can lead to obesity. We know the data about obesity leading to diabetes. If you watch TV for more than 15 minutes, you see an ad for weight reduction or new diabetes medicines because they lead to chronic health conditions. And once multiple systems are involved, not a big leap to early death. And all along that continuum, expenses go up and up and up. The Milbank Memorial Fund did another study of primary care. And they were looking at untreated trauma-related behaviors and what, was, what were, if there were, any common characteristics of individuals who met that criteria. They found five. 
lower productivity, difficulty caring for their children, failed relationships, significant distress and dysfunction, and exactly to the point we're talking about this afternoon, difficulty in health promoting self-care. So let's put a human face on this for a minute. Rita is a 53-year-old Hispanic woman who lives in a small apartment in New York City. Medically, she's pretty ill. Her medical diagnoses, COPD, <laughs> obesity, <coughs> hypertension, and severe depression. When she was 17 years old, she was raped on a New York City subway platform. Others were there, and no one helped. Today, she spends her days mostly watching television, smoking, eating Kraft macaroni and cheese, and eating sweets. From time to time, she coughs up blood. And when she does, she goes to lo the local emergency room, where they very effectively treat her symptoms, give her a wealth of patient education on the consequences of some of her lifestyle choices, and tell her she needs to come in the hospital. That terrifies her, so she leaves. The next time she coughs up blood, she goes to another emergency room. And the process repeats itself <coughs> and repeats itself until at 54 years of old, Rita passes away. But it's not just about people with serious mental illness, and this is an important piece. It might be a 60-year-old man who lives in the suburbs who had a heart attack six months ago. <coughs> his cardiologist tells him his heart is just fine now. But he's scared. So he stopped going upstairs at night to go to bed and is sleeping on the living room sofa. He stopped being intimate with his wife. He's having trouble concentrating uh, at work and he's called an ambulance the last three times he's tried to cut the grass. His cardiologist reminds him that there's nothing wrong with his heart and says he has a friend who's a psychiatrist who he'd be happy to refer him to. To which our suburban friend says, the hell with that, I'm not crazy. So medicine tends to look at us all through a lens of what's wrong with us. They test, treat symptoms, diagnose, roll up bills, rightfully so. They educate us on the ills of the lifestyle choices that we're making as they relate to our health consequences. They put us on the scale over and over again, and much too often watch the needle go up rather than down. They get frustrated and we get frustrated. We all have an inherent need to feel better. And many people will go to almost any length to make sure that happens. Those are noble intentions. And those associated behaviors have emotional anchors to them, even though they have physical health consequences for us. Isn't that really the story of the ACEs? Adverse event, emotional distress, compensatory behavior to feel better, repeat. We will never improve our gross national health until we find an alternative to confronting people with a choice between giving up something that makes them feel safe and comforted for the sake of some future state of well-being. So if we've sort of framed this issue uh, reasonably well in the last few minutes, where do we go from here? I think we need to be thinking about an emotionally informed healthcare system where the behavioral health world plays an ever more significant role in the nation's health, particularly in the area of chronic disease management, where two of the emerging pillars in the research of effective chronic disease management are patient engagement and patient activation. Two things that, through a trauma-informed approach, we can all be expert at. We can help people 
change their health interfering compensatory behaviors to health promoting and still compensatory behaviors. I think we need to begin in developing the emotional dimensions of health care and begin thinking about a continuum of emotional distress from I'm cranky today to I have a serious mental illness and develop a series of interventional strategies along that continuum of emotional distress that help people at every step of that, whether it's Rita or it's our suburban trend. To get from there to where we are today, we have a long way to go. We don't really even have a language to describe the kind of help our suburban friend might need. I don't think he met criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. And, if, and because he might not have, his insurance company wouldn't pay for anything. And if he did meet criteria, he wouldn't go because of the stigma. We all need to be thinking about ways to articulate a new set of value that we can provide in the emerging value-based payment paradigms that are rolling out across the country. We all can play an important role in improving the nation's health. By thinking about helping people move from mere knowledge to wisdom, by helping people replace their cupcakes with confidence and with health. Or we can do what Einstein described and do the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different outcome. <laughs>